Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Sherrard Show. I'm your host, Sherrard. Hope you're having a wonderful Sunday evening. Today, we have a very special show, a very insightful show, where we're going to be talking about where I came from is not where I'm going. And we have a special young lady on the show who's um, been in the industry for many years, um, has done so much in the industry, and she's here to tell her story, her side of the story, the unadulterated um, story of Cherie Marcy. But before we begin, the Sherrard Show is brought to you by Essence Television. Essence Television Network is the new television network for the Sherrard Show, but also broadcasting content all over the world. Um, we are actually taking submissions for new content. So if you would like to have your show, your sitcom, or your film for consideration, just look at your monitor, Essence Television Network. Uh, dot com. And then also the uh, Sherrard Show is brought to you by iHeartRadio. If you ever miss a broadcast of the Sherrard Show or you're traveling and you would like to listen to it, you can also pull it up on iHeartRadio and see the best episodes of the Sherrard Show or hear them on your iHeartRadio. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this young lady um, has worked with the big names such as Beyonce, Jay-Z. She's also um, lived in New York City, worked with Big Boy, you name it, she's been affiliated with him in some way, shape or form. And now she's here on her first appearance on the Sherrard Show to tell her story. Welcome, Sheree, how are you? Hey, Sherrard, thanks. I wanna first start off by saying thanks for having me. I'm great, I'm doing good this evening. Staying safe, nice and quarantined, you know what I mean? Six feet, we, we're definitely six feet away. <laughs> I appreciate, appreciate that. Like this and staying safe. Yeah. Now, Cherie, um, you being still a young lady have such a fascinating story to tell. Um, you st actually were born on an Air Force base out here in California, and you were, I, 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 was your dad in the military? Is that yeah. what it was? Yes, my dad was in the Air Force, and he was married to my mom. I'm their love child. I'm their child number one out of my four siblings. I'm the oldest. And yes, I was definitely born on the Air Force Base. When they brought me out, actually the sun was coming up and there was a window in the hospital and the rays beamed through. And when they finally got me out of there, when it when the when the sun hit all those juices and stuff on top of me, I was glowing. So I've been the golden child ever since. You know what I'm saying? So now um living in Southern California and you've um, been in the industry for many years, but when did your your life really start taking off? Was it in LA or when you moved to New York City? I would say um, I had created a foundation in LA um, uh, as far as networking is concerned and you know being in the scene and, and, and showing face, but I don't think I actually got notoriety or acknowledgement of who I was until I made a name for myself in New York. Yeah. Now, now what And I it? made my name in New York. Uh, Go ahead, I'm listening. Go ahead. Okay, no, I was going to say, um, it's very interesting how I ended up in the entertainment industry in New York. Um, my ex-boyfriend, he actually got an opportunity to um, model. And so they asked him to move from LA to New York. He asked me to come with him. Against my better judgment and my family's approval, I went to New York anyway, um, where he ended up booking the Rockwear campaign. So that's why we were around Jay-Z and what have you. But Long story short, I ended up um, dancing and getting into the go-go uh, scene. And that's what led me into all of the celebrity contacts and, and the crazy life I ended up living through becoming a go-go dancer, eventually into an exotic dancer. Now we'll talk about that in a moment, but um, why were your parents against you moving to New York? You were still a minor or just still very young? No, I was definitely not a minor. I was 24 years old, but um, it was the fact that I had never been to the East Coast before. We we're a close knit family and the guy that I was dating that I ended up, ended up being with for six years. But in that moment, we were only together for like six months. So I looked kind of crazy. I quit my job at the hospital. I was working at the hospital. I had a nice nine to five square job with the 401k and benefits. Um, Hulk Hospital in Newport Beach. Um, and I, you know, basically quit, cashed all my checks in, packed like two suitcases and bounced to New York with him off of his opportunity, but it ended up turning into a great opportunity for myself as well. So now what, what made you start going into um, the go-go scene? Was that your aspiration all the time or did someone just tell you you can make a lot of money? How did you arrive to that decision? Um, well, I've always been in dance. I danced very well. I was on the dance team in high school and uh, in choreography and whatnot in college. 
And um, so I've always had a natural, you know, passion for dance and movement, just period. Um, but what really actually, to be honest with you, which drove me into that field, um, me and my ex, we actually got an opportunity to move from Williamsburg, Brooklyn, where we originally moved to, to Manhattan. And we actually had found an ad on Craigslist with someone who said they were subleasing their apartment, right? So we were so excited. We're like, yeah, you know, we finally gonna come over the bridge and be in Manhattan, not on the outskirts or whatnot. And so they were advertising, a, you know, a apartment. I think it was a studio and whatnot or what have you. So long story short, we met the guy, we gave him the money, we moved all of our stuff in and we mistakenly let him know that we were going back to LA for Memorial weekend. And so we were so excited that we got the place right before the weekend. So we didn't have to worry about it, the stress in our mind. So we flew to LA, did our LA thing, chill with the fam bam. And when we got back to New York, back to our apartment, everything was gone. Everything was cleared out. I'm talking about down to the sheets and the pillowcases. They took everything. So we're like, what? And so we're even, even though we're down and out, we're thinking, you know, even though we got robbed, we can still hustle back. At least we have a roof over our head, right? Well, wrong. Come that morning, there's a knock at the door. It is the actual owner of the apartment with the police because they have been trying to evict the actual person out of that apartment. And so basically he rented it to us illegally, took our money, and he was the one that were they, were, they were trying to get out. So obviously he was you know, long gone and in the wind, but we basically lost everything we owned and all our money. And we were from Cali. So it was a choice of go back to Cali broke and with everybody saying, I told you so, or you gonna hustle back, you know what I mean? And so we decided, you know, to, for me to take that leap into, you know, dancing. And luckily through my LA contacts, I was able to hit everybody I knew up who plugged me with some, some girls in the industry who led me in the right direction. Um, but I did eventually go into exotic dancing on top of go-go dancing though. So, so what's the difference between Yeah, that was just a money move, just a- What's the difference between being go-go dancer and an exotic dancer? Okay, well, in exotic dancing, I actually worked in Larry Flint's Hustler Club on the West Side Highway and 54, 51st Street in Manhattan. That's an actual strip club. You only go down to your, your thong though, it's not nude and it definitely serves alcohol. There are private rooms, but it's not nude. But it's an upscale club. When I was there, Larry Flynn himself would come in there in his wheelchair and be watching the whole scene. My name at that time while I was a dancer was Sasha. Now on the go-go side of things, that's when you're working in nightclubs. Have you ever been to a club and you have the girls that are swinging over the crowd or the girls in the cages? They're not coming out of their clothes. They're just dancing, but they're you know wearing a sexy outfit. So I basically went from the girl in the cage doing the sexy outfit to the girl in the high profile exotic club where my top came down, you know what I'm saying? So now- And um, that's where I met all of my uh, celebrities. Okay, all right. So now ladies and gentlemen, there's a, there, there is a bit of a delay on the line. So um, just know that just a slight tad bit of technical difficulties, we'll get through it. Um, well, again, we are talking to uh, Sheree who is a, she, is a um, she, she's telling her life story and get the story straight so that we can hear it the first time on the Sherrard show. So now you met as being an exotic dancer and in the heart of Manhattan, you met, a, 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 um, that's when the celebrities start coming in. Is that correct? Yes, because um, the, the club was a high profile club, you know, in itself. Um, it's not like what you see today, what girls are, you know, popular and famous for and, you know, what you see on TV with them making it rain and all the money on the floor and girls scratching to pick it up and sweeping money up and money guns and everything. Now, nah, back in my day, or at least at the club I was at, it was very upscale and we wore gowns and you you basically didn't went on the stage, you did your dance and then, you know, someone chose you to take into the private room. That's where you really made good money. And so um, a lot of the people that, you know, were frequent in the club were, a-list celebrities, influential people, investors, Wall Street giants, 
um, athletes, you know, the Knicks was in there, um, the, you know, the, the you know, um, the Giants was in there, you know, um, and so um, in doing um, that, you know, career path, um, just naturally, you were able to network and meet some, you know, very A-list, high-profile people, and they talk about the darnest things in those private rooms. Now, when you say the darnest things, what do you mean? <laughs> Um, well, it's kind of like that's their little getaway, you know, I had a lot of, you know, A-list, you know, major people that, um, you know, regularly came to see me, almost like I was their therapist in a way, because they forgot about the whole dancing aspect of it, and really wanted to talk and conversate and talk about what was going on with them and stuff, so, you know, they would pay, you know, a lot of money per half an hour, you know, for my attention and my time, but, you know, they got away from the dance aspect and really, really wanted to just, you know, chop it up, you know, if you will. And so, and that's why to this day, we're still friends, you know, I have excellent relationships with all my people. Now, um, Sheree, so that kind of leads to my next question. So you um, being in the, in, the, um, in the industry, you actually were one of the top dancers. You said your name was Sasha um, as, your, um, as your exotic dancer name. Now, um, there's a lot of things that what that happened um, in the interim. First of all, did your parents find out that's what you were doing way back in Los Angeles? You know, and that's funny, Shara, you said that because actually to this day, I, th I still think my parents believe that my model boyfriend was taking care of me <laughs> or us. But in actuality, I kind of blew up right along with him. And like, it was times where I was paying the bills and so. I don't think they actually ever found that out maybe until right now, but what they did find out about uh, was my little short stint in the porn industry, which I got into before I went to New York. Okay, now let's talk about that for a moment now. Um, so you you were in the porn industry <laughs> before you became a go-go dancer, an exotic dancer. How did you end up in that? And were you still in LA when that happened? Yeah, actually, yeah, that's a funny story. And I'm glad you asked. Um, that story is very interesting. Um, basically, um, I grew up, you know, in the suburbs, very uh, secluded, you know, um, the big house with, you know, with all the trimmings and whatnot. And um, I got all A's. I was, you know, graduated with honors from high school, Ontario High School. Everybody graduated in maroon. I graduated in white. Um, and so basically, I thought when you go, when you get all A's all four years, you automatically get a scholarship. Well, found out later, you actually have to apply for a scholarship. And no one took the time to sit down with me and tell me that. Not a teacher, not a principal, a counselor, not even my own parents. They were so busy working. And so basically, I got, I applied for USC into Cal State University of Long Beach. I got into both. But because of my parents' work schedule and where they were at financially, they could not afford USC. And I didn't apply for a scholarship, which I would have gotten an academic scholarship had I applied. So I decided to take loans and go to Long Beach State. Now, the twist of all this is, and I feel like this is really what changed the trajectory of my life, because I feel like if I went to USC, I would have probably been on a different path. But because I went to Long Beach State, um, I ended up staying in the dorms, Los Alamitos in Long Beach on the, on, the, on the campus and half of the floor was guys and the other half were girls. It was a co-ed floor. And so the girls on my floor were actually stripping to get through school. They were actually stripping to pay their tuition, to pay their you know, you know, expenses. And they were actually in some cases paying their own mother's rent and their mother's bills off of stripping and dancing. And so those are the girls that took me in and, and imagine this girl from the suburbs who never really been around the limelight or anything like that, just been sheltered. And then now she's in a big city in the dorms in a close proximity with girls with a LA street fast mentality, getting money the stripper way. And those were the girls that took me in and wrapped their arms around me. And that's who I rock with. So in hanging out with them, it just led me to the light. You know? So now that led, so it wasn't porn in, in college, but where did it go from there? I mean, who introduced you literally to that lifestyle? I know you said you were stripping, but stripping is not necessarily pornography. So what led you to the uh, life of porn? And actually, I was I was not stripping. Uh, let me you know correct that I did not strip until I moved to New York, and that's after we got robbed that I become a stripper. I was a college student, 
whose friends were strippers. So I started going to the strip club with them just to hang out. And then that's when I met Jake Steed, uh, who became my boyfriend and the one that turned me into the industry, who I'm in my first, very first movie with. He started out my boyfriend, but he said, hey, I have a way that just by us being who we are, we can get paid forever. That's when you, that's when you thought it was all about money. We all know it's not about, you know, money, right? But that's when you thought it was. And so um, basically, yeah, hanging out with those girls, running with them, led me to meet the guy who turned me into, you know, turned me on to the game. So I'll ask you this question again. Did your parents know that you were into um, pornography up until this interview tonight? My parents found out, and this is a crazy way, and sorry, mom and dad, I've never publicly been able to say sorry. I apologize to my whole family, my siblings, my cousins, aunties, uncles, anybody associated with Sheree, Adria, Sheree, Marcy. Um, but basically, my ex told me that, hey, we're going to make these movies. They're going to only be seen overseas. Nobody will ever find out. You're going to make all this money. And we're going to sign a residual contract. And so you'll get paid forever. So I agreed. And so we shot the movies, right? We shot the movies when I was about 20 years old. My parents found out when I was about 22 or 23 years old because a member of the long-term church that we grew up in and I was raised in, a member of the church found the movie and brought it to the minister of my church who notified my parents, called them into his office and basically let them know, hey, your daughter's doing this <laughs> and that or whatnot. And so it was a very, it was a very dark time in my life. It was very embarrassing. I embarrassed my family because at the time it wasn't cool or accept it like it is now is really taboo and I'm a very like spiritual person I'm not necessarily re religious but I'm very spiritual and you know my morals and my values mean something to me but in that moment and that young immature you know living the fast life I didn't care in the moment and I did it and so now it has it has stuck with me for the last over 20 years I'm still selling currently now my question though <laughs> Cherie is what was that member the Long Beach Church doing with the thing. So I guess they were watching it and saw all of a sudden that it was a member and they right. had to turn That's what I'm saying. <laughs> right. Well, no, the, the member was not of the Long Beach Church. I went to Long College. I went to Long Beach State for college, but my church wasn't in Long Beach. Yeah, it was in uh, La Puente, California. Mm -hmm. La Puente Church of Christ. <clears throat> Someone in that church Brought my movie, yeah. Why were they watching it? Why did they see it exactly? You know, they, they judging me and everything, but they once saw it, you know what I mean? They was watching it, so yeah. you, gotta, you gotta make it, you gotta be able to make it to watch it, right? Yeah, that's it. It. That, either way, if you want either side of the spectrum. Like, yeah, that yeah. part is pretty interesting in terms of that. But moving on from there, let's go back to New York City. Now, um, who are some of the big name people you met uh, being an exotic dancer? <laughs> you want me to name drop? Um, well, you know, there's a lot, 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 a lot of people that um definitely, you know, came through and we hung out in and outside of the club, you know what I mean? Like big names like, you know, the, the artists that you know today and love, you know, like I was you know, like T Pain, Genuine, Elgin, you know what I mean, it was around Jay-Z. And Beyonce, because my ex booked that campaign, you know, it was around Diddy. I worked for Diddy. I made it to Vibe Magazine. They ran a story on the white party. So I made it into Vibe Magazine. Um, ja Rule, uh, Bill Maher, Martin Lawrence, A-Rod. Man, the list goes on and on. Well, it's Neo, that's the homie right there. Neo didn't come into the club. I met Neo through uh, T Pain. Let me correct that. I didn't mean Neo in the club. T Pain took me to the Hip Hop Awards one, one time. That's when I met Neo. And then me and him been like cool ever since, but it wasn't on no in the club like that type stuff. Um, let's see. Juvenile, Lil Wayne, <laughs> 50. Okay, that's one of the main people, 50 Cent, uh, who kid hooked it up. He hooked up a meeting and actually 
50 had gave me an opportunity to start Shea 45 radio station with him when they were very in the beginning stages of it. And who kid hooked up a meeting. I believe we were in the Empire State Building. And in the meeting, it was just 50, me, one of my homegirls, who kid, and one security guard and who was at the door. And we was at this big round table and 50 Cent was over there and I was right here and he offered me that job. But because I was this big time go-go dancer and I was just running around, I didn't like really trust it because 50 was still running with G-Unit. He was still more gangster. He wasn't the businessman he is today. So um, I told him, I basically, I told him, let me think about it. But at the end of the day, I told who kid, let 50 know, nah, I'm good. I'm not trying to do that. And we all know that's a mistake because Shea 45 is one of the biggest <laughs> radio stations and, and you know platforms now, period. So I messed that one up, right? Didn't I? Now, but 50, now, I'm ready for power or mm -hmm. uh, the <laughs> now, how old were you at the time when you turned down the offer from by 50? I was about 28. Mm -hmm. I was so, about 28, so, yep. So how many years did you want? And so, yeah, one of how the many, things. Yeah. Yeah, um, how many years did you work as an exotic dancer before you transitioned to something else? Um, I worked as an exotic dancer along with being a go-go dancer at the same time. And then, you know, I got many other, you know, talents and, and hustles and stuff too. But um, on paperwork, because at Larry Flynn's Hustler Club, we got paychecks along with cash. You make cash, but a lot of times people pay with their credit cards. And that's why I have receipts, because they pay with their credit cards and they would pay us with what we call funny money, like monopoly money. And then we would trade that money in and get an actual check that we had to account for and pay taxes on. So, um, yeah. Now, you know, one thing, um, and then for those who are just joining us, we're speaking to the lovely Sheree um, Marcy, who is um, not only a entrepreneur, but she started a very interesting life um, um, working as a go-go dancer in New York City. But first, before that, she was actually um, a pornography in, a, in the porn industry. And then she uh, made her way with her model boyfriend into being a go-go dancer in um, Manhattan in New York City. And then also going into an exotic dancer and meeting a ton of celebrities. Now, you said something very interesting. Two things we spoke about that you um, said you have no problem mentioning. But the first thing is that um, you felt that T Pain wrote, I'm in love with a script with a stripper. That was uh, one you felt that was dedicated to you. <laughs> now, why do you feel that that was one? I feel like it was, you know, we all know, we all know, though, that T Pain and his wife, they get down with a swirl not and we know that they entertain women together or whatnot so you know it was at a time where you know he was pulling up in new york and like picking me up and whatnot and you know literally picking me up you know what i mean in his vehicle going to his rehearsals and taking me all around manhattan that's how i ended up meeting little kim like you know with t-pain he took the picture so i feel like because that was when it was taboo like now it's accepted you know everybody could you know it's a it's like a trendy thing now but back then it was more taboo so i feel like he wrote that song i'm in love with a stripper about mm -hmm. me but you know i could be wrong i'm sure he had several you know in every in every city possibly but yeah we we spent like cool time with each other and we homies like you know what i mean like he always did right by every everybody that i've mentioned are all homies like there's no bad stories there's no you know, negativity, there weren't no fights, no, no, no craziness. It was all love, you know. Mm -hmm. Now you were mentioning in your um bio that you also met Al Sharpton as well. Now was he he wasn't someone in the in the in the club. You met him at a different time, is that correct? Oh yeah, no, I met him at Diddy's white party. It was a lot of celebrities that would be at his white parties because my job was he would set up these makeshift stages, these personal stages throughout the party and it would be me and like my group it was two you know two other girls besides myself um and they would set the stages up throughout the party so i might be right here my girl might be over there other girl over there and our job was to dance for like 20 to 30 minutes and then we were able to take a 15 minute break and then we had to dance 30 minutes take a break so at those parties it was just you know the a-listers the best of the best i'm talking about diana ross Mary J. Blige, Busta Rhymes, Jacob the Jeweler, Diddy, obviously, and the list goes on and on. So when they would be there, you know, 
watching the go-go dance, they would actually be standing, you know, mingling and like literally watching us. Like Paris Hilton one time was standing there, just literally standing there watching me dance. And I have pictures and everything with all these people. And that's the story they ended up running in Vibe Magazine. They ran a story on Diddy's white parties because they were so elegant. And they ended up giving me, uh, you know, some shout out in that, 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 that story. They put me on the same page with Reverend Al Sharpton, Diddy, and Paris Hilton. We're on the same page. Mm -hmm. Now, tell us the, the moment when you met Matthew Knowles. You have a very, she has a very interesting story about when she met Matthew Knowles, the, the father of um, superstar singer Beyonce Knowles. Now, when did you meet him and where did you meet him? I actually met Matthew Knowles in Los Angeles through my really good friend, Livio Harris. Livio Harris is a major record exec out here in LA doing his thing. Shout out to Livio. That's the homie as well. But Beyonce was having her listening party. And basically um, during her, um, she was having her listening party that she ended up not showing up to actually. Um, it was for the um, Dangerously in Love. It's the album that had, you know, um, that ring me, ring me along. I've been through this too long. I've been failing. But anyway, it had Dangerously in Love and all that stuff on it, but she didn't, and it had video phones. And the reason that Livio was going to take me to the meeting because I was in a company called ACN and we were premiering video phones. It was before you can actually see the person that you're talking to, how we're doing now, and it's a common thing. It was before that technology was around and had just come out. And so Beyonce had a song called Video Phone. So I wanted to try to get a deal together with Beyonce and ACN where um, her video phone song could go with the actual video phone device. But what happened was Livio took me to Beyonce's listening party in Los Angeles and Beyonce didn't end up showing up. I think she had a, another prior engagement maybe in New York, somewhere else, but Matthew was there. And so I'm just there as one of you know the rest of the people there to listen. But for some reason, he gravitated to me. He introduced himself to me and um, we exchanged numbers. And then from there, we became friends. And then we maintained our friendship um, throughout, you know, the whole situation of me going to New York. And, and even Matthew um, even took a meeting with me and um, one of the big people in the company, Danny Bay, this Korean cat. Shout out to Danny Bay. He got a virtual reality device right now, GPS, that's that's on the market. Um, we're doing really good, um, $15 million company right now. But anyway, um, Matthew actually flew me and Danny Bay out for a meeting over the video phone to New York. Uh, but what happened was Beyonce ended up doing a remix version with Lady Gaga. And so their direction changed and the song was different. It didn't pertain to the, the concept we were trying to bring to them. So the deal didn't end up going through. But because of that, me and Matthew knows we were like this, and you know, we ended up kicking it on a personal level as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, this was right during a time when he was still married to Tina knows, or that was uh, after. Yes, he, I, I believe he was still married to Tina. Yes, he was. Yes, now, he now was. something you were telling me. Now, you you can always stop me and say if you that you don't want to share it in terms of that, but we can um, go there if you'd like. But you were mentioning something that when it hit the tabloids that um, Matthew had um, impregnated and had a, ch a child out there by um, another woman. Y um, you know who that woman was and is, is that correct? Uh-huh, <laughs> uh-huh. Um, I'm gonna just say that, you know, I put a warning out there and he didn't abide or heed to the warning. And so basically, you know, uh, it's evident and it came to fruition uh, what transpired after you know he uh, decided to keep doing what he was doing even though there was a warning that was um, shot that way you know to prevent anything like that but yeah he did his thing and now you know he has you know children outside of his marriage at the time because of it wow wow now um after leaving the um, in exotic world, what did you go into after that? Well, I've always been an entrepreneur. I've always been a strong connect connector and networker. And so um, when I decided to move back to, go on, Cody. Cody wants to say hi. Say hi real quick. It's my son, Cody. He raps and sings. He's coming, y'all. What's up, man? You'll, you'll hear How are you, young man? 
Hello there. Playing his game. We're gonna talk to you next time. I'm gonna talk to you next time. Is that right, little man? We'll see you next time. Great looking young man. Great. <laughs> Thank you. But um, basically, yeah. Um, long story short, <laughs> my ex ended up cheating on me with Rihanna and Megan Good. And basically, he had a phone, uh, another phone I didn't know about that I found. And when I went through that phone, it was pictures of you know him and Rihanna smoking blunts, her her naked boobs out, um, Megan Good, you know, messages back and forth. And then Rihanna ended up putting him in her video called Take a Bow. So if you go look on uh, Rihanna's um, you know, music playlist and go on YouTube and look up Take a Bow, my ex's name is Anthony Gallo. And you know, I got all kinds of pictures and receipts to prove everything. And I'm sure he wouldn't deny it because it was just obvious. Um, but yeah, so when I hit up Rihanna, like, yo, you know, and this is this was early Rihanna. This is come on, little boy, boy, can you get it in? You know, it was that Rihanna. It wasn't, you know, the mega, mega, mega Rihanna that we know today, but she was still doing her thing. And so, you know, she her titties is hanging out, blunt in her mouth, him with his hand on her titties and stuff like that. And so, you know. When I realized that, you know, I'm, I can't compete with these ladies, you know, these are, you know, superstars and whatnot. Like, I, you know, I'm not, I can't compete. I'm out. That's what made me, you know, leave New York and fly back to L.A. because I, I didn't feel like competing and I didn't want that smoke with all these females in the industry. So I dipped. And so I came back to Cali and I just pursued my, my business as far as um, entrepreneurship. Um, I got into medical marijuana way back then before it was legalized, you know, so I'm connected in that world as well. Um, I'm just, uh, you know, I've just always been a mover and shaker, so. Yeah, you know, um, and it's one thing about you, Cherie, um, I personally know you have a, a great business aptitude. You're always making big moves, connecting people with people, and um, you're always a very positive person that's always looking at the brighter side of things. Um, and with that being said, Cherie, what kind of advice would you give to young people out there who um, are taking or about to take the path you've gone on? Would you tell them not to? You wouldn't change one thing you've ever gone through? What kind of advice would you give? Definitely. That's a great question, Cherie. I appreciate you asking that question because that is something I definitely want to touch on. Um, through my journey and everything I've gone you know, through, my mission and my goal, I believe that God gave me is actually to help those women that have gone down um, the sexual world or the, um, the stripper world, porn world, sex trafficking, you know, prostitution, you name it. Um, I want those women to know that even though you have sold your body or have done things for money that, you know, you're not proud of, God still loves you. If you think and you and you believe in God and the Bible, um, you remember that Jesus allowed a prostitute to walk with him. And you know why he did that? Because he knew that was going to attract all the sinners he needed to talk to. So sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, it may seem like you're sexualized and you have, you know, this curse on you, the good look virus. And it may seem that everybody wants you for your looks as a trophy, just to have sex with you, to you know, to, to basically steal your energy. I want I want those ladies and gentlemen to know that God still loves you, and you are not too dirty to make it to heaven. You are not too unclean to help the next person get on the right path. All you have to do is decide. You know, you want more for yourself. Now, I'm not saying that. Mommy, I need my help. Okay, please go in the room, thank you. Now, I'm not saying that, um, you know, any girl, everybody who's stripping everything, they wrong, they, you know, they doing the wrong thing to each his own. What I'm saying is, if you've gone down that path, but it hasn't gone the way you want it to go, or, you know, you've realized that, you know, you want more for yourself, you want to feel more whole. It's not all about money. God doesn't want that at the end of the day. When you go to heaven, he's not going to say, thanks for the bag you know, come on in. Um, that's the last thing he wants. You know, actually money is just a tool for us to maneuver here on, on earth because everything around us is a facade. We're all spiritual beings having a physical experience. So I want to be the voice for those ladies that have gone into that sexual industry 
and they feel unclean and they feel like they can't hold their head up or they feel like all they can do is be a stripper, all they can do is shake their butt, all they can do is get on their knees and to get ahead. I want you to know that you don't have to do that if you decide that you want to do more with yourself. You, you know, you could do that. And for all the ladies that's currently dancing, just make the money and don't let it make you. You know what I'm saying? Very good. Very good stuff. So, um, Sheree, got two more um, things I want to ask you and then I'll let you out of here. Now, um, <clears throat> what is the difference? And this is a question that just prompted up. Um, someone asked, and this is uh, from Kyle from, wow, from Mississippi. Kyle wants to know, um, Sheree, first of all, he says you look absolutely gorgeous. And Kyle wants to know, what's the oh, difference between, Kyle wants to know, what's the difference between you and um, Kareem Steffens? your stories that is an excellent question kyle i am so glad you brought her up shout out to corinne shout out to superhead um that is an excellent question the difference between me and her i would say first of all i wasn't showing up on video sets you know just giving fellatio like and i'm telling my story not to um I feel like the angle that she came in, I'm sure she told her truth, but I feel like she did it in a kind of attacking kind of a, um, um, what's the word? Like kind of like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if she has good relationships with the people that, that she ended up interacting with. Me on the other hand, I have great relationships with my people and I'm not telling my story to tell on anybody to like, you know, make money or gain profit. I'm just telling my truth so people can understand me. So when I drop my music, you know what, you know where I'm coming from. Um, everybody, you know, has a life that they've been chosen to live. And if we believe in a higher power, we know that we're not in control. So because certain women are put in positions um, in the industry and sexual lives, a lot of times the only thing we have is our voice to speak out. And if that ends up yielding us a profit because people want to hear it that bad, then so be it. Um, but the difference between me and Karen, you know, Corinne, I would say is, I feel like I still have positive relationships with everybody I dealt with. And I'm not telling my story to tell on anyone. I'm just telling my story so you guys can know me and understand me. Where I feel like she went wrong is I feel like she was attacking everyone that she told her story about. Very good, very good. Now, um, Sheree, are you planning on um, putting your life in a book? Yeah, actually, that, that's good. I'm, I'm actually with my writers right now. We're putting together the book. It's going to be a book, which is going to um, translate into a movie. It's going to be several movies. And definitely music is going to be dropping this uh, next coming year, 2021. Me and my son are putting music out. And the music is, that's why I said, um, the music is going to tell a lot of my story. And um, me and my son, we have separate music that, you know, pertains to the youth. But, you know, my music is going to be a little bit more detailed and graphic only because oh I already lived through it. And so um, definitely, with, I mean, bring the interviews on. We're talking about books, movies, you know, TV shows, Netflix, holler at me, you know. Very good. Very good. All right, Sheree, last question and, and I'll get you out of here. Um, where can people be able to reach out to you and connect with you, seeing this interview and want to keep a tab with you? Um, Facebook, social media handles, et cetera. Okay, I appreciate that, uh, Sherrod. Thank you so much. Um, yes, definitely, guys. You can follow me on um, Facebook. I have two pages. Sheree Marcy, that's S-H-E-R-I. Marcy is M-A-R-C-E-Y. And then also Adria Marcy, which Adria is actually my first name, if you guys didn't know. Sheree's my middle name. I go by my middle name. But Adria is A-D-R-I-A. -A. Marcy, same last name, obviously, M-A-R-C-E-Y. And then on Instagram, um, it's just my first, middle, and last name, Adria Sheree Marcy on IG. I'm only on Facebook and IG right now, y'all. Um, I got a snap. I'm not really on it. I need to start an Instagram. I mean, a, a Twitter and a TikTok, I guess. But yeah, find me well, on we, Facebook and Instagram. I appreciate all the love and support. Well, we appreciate you, Sheree. We thank you for stopping by the Sherrard Show. That is, and that is it for me. We want to thank her first for uh, stopping by and sharing her wonderful story. Um, this is only part one of it. She's going to be back on the show um, soon to give you part two, three, four, I and maybe say, five. You got to bring me back. We're right. It's like definitely. 10 episodes we got to do, my brother. We definitely <laughs> will. But again, um, she's humble. She's sweet. And she has great things going on. And, I, and um, 
has great favor with me because she's a hardworking young lady doing big things. So you definitely can see this episode again on Comcast NBC, the Rewind Network, as well as on my television network, Essence Television. And then you also can see it on iHeartRadio. All this is on your monitor. Make sure you subscribe to The Sherrard Show. On our next episode of The Sherrard Show, we're going to have Mr. David Alec Greer is going to stop by The Sherrard Show for a laughing good time, ladies and gentlemen. In the meantime, see you next week. Bye-bye now. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Sherrod Show. If you like additional information about our episodes, you can log on to thesherrodshow.com. You can also check us out on social media, like us on Facebook, look at our YouTube videos, subscribe to our newsletter at essencetelevisionnetworks at gmail.com. If you would like to get information to the host, Sherrod, you can email him at thesherrodshow.com. Once again, thank you for joining us and we'll see you next week.